Amen. Tell you what, he is all we need. Amen. Amen. Folks, I have good news for you. God's church is very much alive. Amen. God's not dead. The church is not dead. Christianity's not on the uh, not on the, the on the tail end of the dog, and they're not running and hiding their heads, but. God's church is alive and well on planet earth, and it's growing rapidly every day. So many Christians in our day are discouraged, particularly American Christians, because we see the plight of what's happening in our nation, and we see the turn from being a God-fearing nation to a, to a secular nation, and, it, and it's, sometimes it's depressing, and we, we think maybe God's not doing anything. Maybe we're losing the battle, but uh, America has changed a lot in our time. In my lifetime, I've seen it change from being a God-fearing nation to a secular nation. But it's easier to allow ourselves to become discouraged if we only look at what's happening here in our nation. But I want to tell you this. God's on the move. He's been on the move for 2,000 years. The church is not dead. It's very much alive. And God's on the throne. In fact, I spoke to him a while ago. I hope you did. He's still on the throne. Jesus is at the right hand interceding for us, and he's praying for us right now before the Father. And I thank God that I'm a part of his great church. See, the church is not just Countryside Baptist Church. The church is Christians that are of all nationalities and all languages and, and all people from around the earth. And I know that it's a, it's a great honor and a privilege, as millions of other pastors are out there today sharing the same thing I'm sharing. Let me encourage you today that God's church is very much alive. Let's begin with prayer this morning, and we're going to be going to Matthew chapter 16, if you want to be turning there. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for your church, Lord. When you told us you would build your church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it, Lord, and I know that's a true statement, because you made it. And Lord, I know that this is not my church. This is not a Keith church. This is not a deacon church. This is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're committed to you. We're committed to spreading your gospel. And Lord, help us to be the people that you want us to be right here on 39th Avenue in Gainesville, Florida. Help us to be a, on the cutting edge of what you're doing in your church today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Go to Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to begin reading with verse 13. Matthew 16, 13. The word says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You're blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that, that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. May God bless the reading of his precious, holy, anointed, inspired, infallible, inerrant word. Amen? Because we believe that this is God's book. It's not my ideas. It's not your ideas. It's not a collection of mossy back stories from preachers of old, but it's actually the inspired, inerrant, living word of God without error. Now, the first thing I want to share with you this morning is the fact that God's church is built on Jesus Christ. A casual reading of that passage of Scripture, you might think otherwise. But Jesus asked them who they believed that he was. And Peter gave the right answer, didn't he? What did Peter say? You're the Son of the living God. You're the Messiah. See, he got the right answer. Jesus made it plain in this passage of Scripture that the church will be, be built with only one cornerstone himself. Because he said, That's, you're Peter. You used to be Simon Peter. Now you're, you're just the rock. You're the little rock. But he said, Upon this rock, I'll build my church. So he didn't build it upon Peter. Now, Peter was important. He was an important man. He helped usher in the church age. He, he opened the church age to the Jews in Acts 2. He opened the church age to the Gentiles in Acts 10. But he was not the cornerstone of the church. Yes, he is listed as one of the apostles, and he's in the foundation stones of the church. But the chief cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. The real church of the living God is based on Jesus, the solid rock. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand all other ground is sinking sand. 
It's based upon Jesus Christ, the solid rock. Isaiah 28, 16 said it this way. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm placing a foundation stone in where? Not Rome, <laughs> in Jerusalem. A firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. See, the church is not built on Peter, even though Peter was an important apostle. And he ushered in the church age, and he preached on Pentecost, and he preached to all sorts of people in that day, and, and died a, a martyr's death. He still is not the cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Ephesians says it this way. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. So now, so now you Gentiles, now who are the Gentiles? Us. So you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We're carefully joined together in him becoming a holy temple for the Lord. I love what one, one writer said about Peter. Let me turn to it because it just kind of jumped out at me said, at a certain point, Jesus gave to Simon a new name, Peter. His true name from then on was not, it was, was, then on was the one Jesus had given him, not the one he was known, by which he was known. He thought of himself as Peter. The past of a certain Simon no longer belonged to him. Isn't it neat that when you're saved, you're a different person, you get a new name? And Peter got saved, and his life was changed, and, and, he, and he amounted to something for God. And, he, and he, it, God used him to, to actually, with the keys, to open the, the church age. But at a certain point, uh, Simon Peter declared, I'm something different from what I have been. I'm not Simon, but I'm Peter. When you call Simon, I will not turn my head. If he were here today, he would probably change the name on his driver's license. You see, God changed his name, and, and when you come to Christ for salvation, he changes your name. You're not the same person anymore. He gives you a brand new life. And no matter who you are, what you've done, or who you've done it with, matters nothing to the Lord Jesus because his blood can cleanse the foulest sinner. <laughs> he can make the sinner clean. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Matthew or Mark 12, 10 says, And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is to become the head of the corner. The head of the corner is like a four-sided pyramid and you have a capstone on top. Kind of like our, at the Washington Monument that says, To God be the glory for our nation. Jesus is the capstone of the whole deal. All of God's work and all of God's uh, effort to build the church. He put Jesus as the chief capstone, the chief cornerstone. If you go to Acts chapter 4 for a minute, and we're going to park here just for a minute, but go there with me. Acts chapter 4. You might recall this, this part of the story. In, uh, it says, and they were speaking to the people. And this is when Peter and John get arrested at the same period of time, okay? So and they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of you who heard the message believed. Many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. That's a pretty big revival, would you think? So it came about on the next day that the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest and it was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. And when they had placed him in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Now, they were in trouble. Call before the authorities. The uh, man I mentioned to you over in India, Pandu Madela. Remember, we prayed for him on Wednesday night. Right now, he's facing the same thing. The authorities have come down. They're trying to shut the whole ministry of that particular Baptist ministry down in India. And I, I spent about an hour online with him yesterday, encouraging him and sharing scriptures with him. But I shared with him, it's just like this, just like Acts 4 and other places, you know. And I said, the Lord will give you words to say when the time comes. When you're called before the authorities, you'll know what to say. And God will give you wisdom. I said, when they place them in the center, verse 7, they begin to inquire, what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we, on or if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, 
as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. Now look at verse 12. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. And there is, no sal there is salvation in no else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Hallelujah for what God's word says. Hey, Peter, I mean, uh, Pandu Medela, I shared with him, I said, listen, what are they going to lock you up for? You've been feeding orphans. <laughs> You've been clothing the orphans. You've been taking care of them when nobody loved them. And you need, I said, when you go before them, ask them, say, I'm an Indian citizen. I love my country. I'm not trying to destroy my country. I'm trying to feed my fellow brothers. I'm feeding them. I'm clothing them. Why are you locking me up? <laughs> and I, I shared how, how that Peter, you know, he says, if, I'm here, if we're here because we healed this guy, <laughs> well, okay, we did it in the name of Jesus, so what? <laughs> Listen. There's no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. There's nobody else in history that's ever been the cornerstone. And Jesus is the cornerstone. He said, I'll build my church. You see, God's church is ever expanding. It's rapidly expanding across our globe. The Bible Society of the United Kingdom calculates that the number of Bibles printed between 1816 and 1975 was around 2.45 billion. By 1992, the estimated printed number rose to nearly 6 billion and by 2007 to 7.5 billion Bibles printed on the earth. This means there's roughly one copy of God's word for each person on the earth. <laughs> Can you believe that? Wow. You know, one copy for each person on the earth. Clearly, the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. These figures do not include the countless digital versions of the Scriptures being accessed today by computers, smartphones, iPads, etc., etc. A complete translation of God's Word has now been published in over 450 languages. The New Testament alone has been distributed in nearly 1,400 languages, which the, with the Gospel of Mark in over 2,300 languages. The re they represent the primary means of reaching over 90% of the world's population with God's truth. These statistics reflect the fact that the United States, since its inception, its inception has been a Bible-reading and Bible-believing nation. This is evidence in such founding doc documents as the Constitution and Bill of Rights. The preamble of nearly every state constitution invokes the name Almighty God. Until recently, God's Word was used for basic, teaching the basic standards of private and public moral conduct. It has been the foundation of America's laws and judicial system. Because of the adherence to the Bible and its principles, the United States has been blessed beyond measure, making it the wealthiest and most generous nation in the world. People in the United States annually contribute billions of dollars to churches and private charities in order to help the less fortunate. The U.S. government also contributes billions of taxpayer dollars in assistance to many of the downtrodden nations of the world. In the 20th century, America was at the forefront when it came to fighting wars in the name of God to rid the world of evil despotism. Furthermore, for over 100 years, all denominations of Christian churches in the United States have been the primary leaders in preaching the gospel to the world. Yet these stark facts and figures chronicle a story far greater than the numbers alone suggest. The document, the awesome fulfillment of Jesus Christ's prophecy that assuredly in the end times the gospel would be preached and published throughout the entire world before the end. Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Folks, listen to me. This is a map. You can't really see it good. I don't think I can blow it up very much. But the estimated population of the world, Christians, by country. And if you go to Google and Google in Christianity in the world today and look for the Pew uh, research, you'll find these same things. But listen, the gospel has been inroads in every nation on the earth. There are millions upon millions of Christians in the church today. In the United States alone, there are 246,780,000 that claim that they are a Christian person. Now, does that mean they're really saved? No. 
But I'm going to let the Lord sort it out. At least there are people that say they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they believe that he's a savior. Now, whether or not they're saved, I'm not going to worry about that. Only know this, there are that many people in this nation that say they're saved. In Brazil, 175 million. In Mexico, 107 million. Almost 108 million. In, in Russia, 105 million. And, and on and on we could go. If you break that down by major denominations or traditions, about half of them are Catholic and about half of them are the rest of us. Uh, if you break it down by years... In 1910, America was 27.1% Christian. In 2010, we are 36.8% Christian. Folks, God's church is on the rise even in a, in a nation that is going against God in a lot of ways. We're still part of the population of the world. And, and, it, and don't hide, hide your head and get ashamed of who you are. I'm a, I'm a proud follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. See, God's church is going to continue to grow until he removes it from the earth. It started 2,000 years ago, and it hadn't stopped. It started with a few people, didn't it? Twelve men in an in a, in a upper room, and then the 120 in an upper room, and they waited for the Holy Spirit to come. And it spread around the world, and, and it's exploded. It's very much alive, and it will continue to grow until the day that God calls us home. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says it this way. It says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. The, the brothers and sisters that have died in their faith and, and are, are in the grave now. So don't, don't be uninformed about them. So that you grieve not like the rest who have no hope. We do a lot of funerals. I've done two in the past two weeks. And I'll do more in the future. And I'll do some for you and I do some for other people from other places. Sometimes people don't even have a family don't even have a church, and they call us and need to be buried. And I try to do a good job of giving them a good burial along with the, the local funeral homes. But I know this. There's a difference when you go to the, the funeral of a believer versus a non-believer. Because non-believers don't have the hope we do. You see, we have hope beyond the grave. We know that when we close the casket and we put that body away, that's not the end. Because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. You believe in me? He says, I'll raise you up even though you die. You know, that's a pretty good promise, isn't it? And here, 1 Thessalonians, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, don't, that we don't grieve as the rest who have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so also we believe that God will bring with them those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. See, the people that have, have died and they're in the grave, they haven't just disintegrated and, and gone to the worms and, and just into dust, No. God took their soul part with him, and they're with him, and they're going to come back. Verse 15 says, For we tell you this by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will surely not go ahead of those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive who are left will be suddenly caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Listen, death is not the end. It's just the beginning. And I can't wait. You know what? Your, your man's out there, isn't he? He's waiting on the resurrection, and, and Pop Hammond's out there waiting on the resurrection. My grandma once, they love God, and my granddaddy said, love God. They love Jesus, and they were, they were waiting on the, this trumpet sound because... And they always thought maybe the rapture would come in our lifetime, and it didn't. And I hope it'll come in mine, but it might not. I'm working and, and living as if it's going to be within the next five minutes. But you know, God could, could tarry a long time. You don't know. We need to live as if it's going to be right now. But you know, I know this. Whenever it is, which I think it will be soon, when we hear that sound, we're going to be gone. We're going to be out of here. Can you imagine what would happen in this world when all the Christians are suddenly gone? There's some people that wish we were. <laughs> they, we could get rid of that bunch of knotheads, you know. Listen, be encouraged today because God's church cannot be stopped. It's an unstoppable force. Jesus said, I will build my church. I've been to church conferences where they say how to double your attendance and how to get more people to stay in your church and, and all, all sorts of gimmicks that humans come up with on how to build. I get a magazine every month that my dad and mom bought the subscription for me. And did you read that? I sure did that. Sure did, mom. And they have a lot of good ideas, you know. But guess who said he'd build his church? 
God did. He said, I will build my church. And since that, for 2,000 years, the church has been on the march and been growing. Did you know that worldwide there are 2,184,060,000 believe, believers on the earth? I'm trying to get my red dot to light up. Right there, 2,184,060,000 31% of the world's population is Christian. What? Go fit. Hey, does that encourage you a little bit to know you're not by yourself? We're not American Christian nation all by ourselves. And oh, no, we're going to hold on to the rapture. No, God's church is on the march. God's church is still growing all over the earth. Hey, in the Americas alone, there are 804 million and 70,000 believers. Talking about uh, Canada, United States, Mexico, and South America. 804 billion Christians, or million Christians. That's 86% of the population of the, the Americas is Christian. Give God a hand for that, huh? That's God doing that. God's church is, church is alive, folks. It's not dead. We're not, we're not hiding in the closet and waiting for Islam. Oh, no, they're going to cut our heads off. Listen, we're on the march. We're on the move. Uh, in China, there are 67 million Christians. Some estimate as much as 124 million. But known statistics say 5% of the Chinese population is Christian. <laughs> what? Chinese Chi-coms are Christians? Yeah, yeah, 67 million of them. You know, it kind of gives me a, 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 hope, a hope that we never have to bomb them. Hope we never get in a shooting war with them because we'd kill a bunch of Christians, wouldn't we? Hey, China is coming to Christ. I was at a Bible study Thursday night, and James Lofton, working on campus out there, has had quite a few Chinese come to the gospel lately. And here are some high-ranking official Chinese communist kids that are working on their PhDs at the University of Florida, getting paid for by communist money, and they're believing the gospel and reading the Word of God every week. <laughs> Woo! Jesus said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. What about the Asia-Pacific Rim? There are 285 million Christians there. 13 or 7% of the population of that area is Christian. We're not going behind, folks. We're, it's growing every day. It's grown for 2,000 years. It's not, we're not hiding in a hole. We're not, oh, we're going to hold out to the right. No, we're on the march. The Christianity is on the move. And, and it's still the largest religion on the earth. Now, the Muslims are overtaking us. That doesn't matter. Jesus said, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. What about Middle and East North Africa? Middle East. 12,840,000 in the Middle East. They're all Muslims. Wait a minute. They're all Muslims. There's 12 million brothers and sisters there, just like you, that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What about Europe? In Europe, pagan Europe, there are 565 million Christians in Europe. Wow. 76.2% of the, 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 the European countries say they're Christian. What? I thought, I thought they were all pagans and we're the only Christian. Oh, we're the whole, the last holdout. No, God has people all around the earth. God's church is on the move. God's church is on the mark. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. What about India? Where my brother Pandu is probably in prison this morning. <laughs> India. I encouraged him with this yesterday. I said, brother. You're not alone. There are 31,850,000 people in India that claim the name of Christ. Wow! In, the, in a Hindu and Muslim country that has all the pagan deities and there's still a church there. And it's still going strong. India, you know. See, God's church has been growing for over 2,000 years now and it's still alive and well. God's not dead. His church's not dead. It's still growing. It's still alive. But time is almost up. I believe that the time clock is ticking down. Now, I didn't add all those people up, but I know there are 2.1 some odd billion Christians on the earth right now looking for the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I start thinking this week, <laughs> and I think Bob and I were talking about this. I says, what in the world kind of transport is he going to get that many people up in the air at the same time with? You ever thought that thought? <laughs> that's a big, hey, that's a big God that can listen to 2.1 billion people crying out to him for help. Just think of the prayers of God's people coming up around the earth right now. Billions of prayers, and yet God can hear each one of them. Not only can he hear each one of them, he knows every person by name. He knows every hair that's on their head. That's a big God. 
And that's the God I serve, and that's the God I worship, and that's the God I proclaim to you today. He knows everything about you and loves you and cares about you. You see, very soon now, God will call his church home. Very soon now. And uh, I sure hope you're ready. I really do. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come or not arrive until the rebellion comes. And the man of lawless, lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Have you noticed lately how many people are breaking the law? Now, in our day, in the 70s, when, when that was when it kind of started, you know, and resist authority, that was on their bumper stickers, you know, and don't trust anybody over 30. That's what we, at Santa Fe, all the people had that on their bumper stickers, you know. Resist, had to fist, you know, and, and, the, and the hippies kind of, they, they didn't really get real bad resistance, but they tried, you know, and, but they were, peace, oh, put a flower in your gun, you know. And, and then, the, they, then the, Black, the Black Panthers, they came out, oh, yeah, kill, 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 you know, and that, I mean, that was the start of it. Now look at it. There's some real threats to our security now because those people, the hippies, have become the presidents and the congressmen and stuff. And they still smoke dope and do all those things and, and believe weird. And they're running our government. Something wrong with that picture. And then the, and then the other side, they want to just destroy everybody. And kill, well, I'm not too, much, too worried about that because it's right on target, right on the time frame. And it still is not going to shut the church of God down, okay? It's still not going to shut the church of God down. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come and not arrive until the rebellion comes and the lawless man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. And as a result, he takes his seat in God's temple, displaying himself as God. Surely you recall that I used to tell you these things while I was still with you. And so you know what holds him back. And underline that because you need to understand what holds the man of sin back so that he will be revealed in his own time. For the hidden power of lawlessness is already at work. However, the one who holds him back will do so until he's taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will destroy by the breath of his mouth and wipe out by the manifestation of his arrival. I really personally believe that the Word of God clearly teaches that what is holding and restraining evil is the power of God's Holy Spirit on this earth that lives inside of you. The church is there to, it's kind of like salt on meat in the old days before they had refrigeration. They had to use salt to keep stuff from rotten. You had to have either refrigeration or salt. And the church has been the salt for this generation for a long time now. Read Psalms 2 sometime because you'll, you'll understand what God thinks about it because it says they, they're taking up plans against God and His anointed and they wanted to get, do away with their rules. We don't want to hear what you have to say. Don't cram your religion down our throat. You're not going to dictate morality to us. You know that? The cry of the left. Listen, the Bible says God sits in heaven and laughs. He laughs at them and He said He's going to mess them up. All their plans will come to naught because one day... It says they better bow down and kiss the son lest he be angry. They're going to be at the feet of Jesus and, and know who he is and confess who he is, but it'll be too late. You see, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's going to set up his kingdom and he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. His church is alive and well. It's on the march. It's going to stay on the march until he calls it home one day. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, it said, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those who had been given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony about Jesus and become the, because of the Word of God. In our history of our lifetime, how many beheadings have you heard about until now? You might have heard of a few in the past. You had not heard of many until now, have you? But now there's a crescendo of beheadings in the, in the name of Allah, Allah. And they cut the heads off of those that proclaim the name of Jesus. Listen. Talking about those folks. Verse five, 4, the second part. These had not worshipped the beast or his image and had refused to receive his mark on their forehead or hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead, did, the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who takes part in the first resurrection. 
The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be encouraged today. Know that the church of God is alive and well. Jesus is still on the throne and, and he's got his sword ready. And he's going to come and he's going to straighten it all out. And if you know Christ, you'll be a part of that. If you don't know Christ and you die during that tribulation, you're gonna, you're gonna, your body's going to be in the ground for a thousand years until the great white throne judgment one day. But if you know Christ and he's your Savior, you're going to be raised and, and you're actually going to rule and reign with Christ. See, if you're not part of God's church, you're going to get left behind. If you're toying with Christianity and say, oh, I don't know, I might, I might believe, I think I ought to. Maybe someday I will. I kind of want to sin a little bit. I kind of want to enjoy my life a little bit. Then I might come to Christ. Listen, wrong answer. Wrong answer. Who do men say that I am, Peter, or disciples? Well, they, some of you said you're a prophet, and some of them said this, and some what do you? Well, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's why we follow you. And Jesus said, that's the rock I'm going to build my church upon. I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You see, you have to make your choice now. You're not going to get to make your choice then. There is no purgatory. There is no second chance. You have to make your choice now. If you're not part of God's church, you're going to get left behind. And if you've heard the gospel and you don't believe, you'll be left behind and, and you will be doomed forever to a life in hell without God. You won't have another chance. See, people, oh, I'll get another chance. I'll, I'll just choose that. Oh, I... I really want to be saved. I'll, I'll pick God one day. Uh, uh. You can be that stupid if you want to be. Really. You can be that stupid if you want to be. But if you do, you're a fool. If you wait and you don't come to Christ, you don't run to Him when you hear the gospel, you're a fool because you will be deceived one day if you don't. If you get left behind, here's what the Word says. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 The arrival of the lawless one will be by Satan's working with all kinds of miracles and signs and false wonders. And with every kind of evil deception directed against those who are perishing because they found no place in their hearts for the truth so as to be saved. Folks, you better find some place in your heart for the truth. You better listen to God when He's calling you. You won't, you won't pick the time to be saved. God picks that time. And when God taps on your heart's door, you better respond right then because if you don't, this is what's going to happen to you. Consequently, God sends them strong uh, uh, sends on them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false. You don't believe when He calls you, you reject that. God won't let you believe then. He says He's going to send you a, a deluding influence so that you, you will believe the false lie. In verse 12, And so all of them who have not believed the truth but have delighted in evil will be condemned. There won't be any chance out of, out of that, that situation. You'll be doomed forever. But you know the good news? In each and every generation, God calls out new men and women to join Him in His church. Every generation. In my dad's early years, God called him. He was working on, at Victor Chemical Company, making some kind of phosphate type stuff, the government, whatever they use that for, gunpowder or whatever. And there he was, minding his own business, and God reached down and tapped on his, his life and said, you boy. <laughs> and my dad said, yes, sir. A few years later, God called Jerry Milton. Now, where were you at when you, God called your brother Jerry? Do you remember exactly? High school, God tapped him on the shoulder and called him. I was riding in a pickup truck, Ford, a green Ford pickup truck on Highway 27 between Bronson and Chiefland. And God came down and invaded that truck. The presence of God was so strong, I couldn't hardly stand it. It made me weep. It made me so humbled. I didn't get up and flip out and speak in tongues like a lot of people. Oh, I'm in the presence of God, I'm going to do that. No, you don't. when you're in the presence of God, that's not how you act. You're humbled. Because of the holiness and righteousness of God. And God tapped on my heart's door. And I said, yes, Lord. A few years ago, God called my son. My, God, my son, when we first had the meeting about the cowboy church, he said, I, I'm all for that. But I'm, I won't never, I'm not going to be the preacher now. I'm not getting up and speaking. Now he's one of the greatest cowboy preachers in the state. Go figure. Somebody that's quiet and can't do it. And God called him to do it. And now, now look in our, in our midst. God's calling out some Bobbies and some Scots and some Cenas. You know. They, were, they weren't looking for that. Were you looking for that, Bobby? When God, no. 
He had his life already planned out, what he was going to do, and yet God singled him out and called him to do what he was going to do. Here's a few others that, in a, a real good book I'm reading called The Oracles of God. If you ever get a chance to read it, you need to read this book. It's awesome. Talking about God working around the world and how he does it. The, the initial work of Christian missions among the Matacoas and Tobas in Argentina was very difficult. For one thing, the missionaries had to walk 50 miles from their station through the jungle to get to these tribes. One of their first converts was an Indian who had, who had come ornate, or, ornamented, ornamented with feathers. In his hand, he had a heavy stick with which he had just killed his mother. It was a custom to kill the dying to free them from evil spirits. In order to obtain their magical powers, witch doctors ate their firstborn children. Yeah. Yet, such men were converted, and some even became evangelists because this pe these people went there and told them about Christ. William Carey was inflamed for missionary work by reading about Captain Cook's journeys. He asked himself this, If others can rise to s so much out of a spirit of adventure in the, in the desire to ser serve science, why should we not do the same in the service of Christ? You've heard of William Carey, haven't you? In his cobbler shop, he put a map on the wall and noted what, what he knew about the religions of different peoples. He constantly had on his mind the millions who were lost. As an assistant preacher in a small Baptist community, he attended a church conference and asked whether the commandments to preach to all nations was still binding. He was not allowed to continue. He was called a miserable enthusiast. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of churches, huh? A lot of churches today don't, don't think we're obligated to share the gospel or ought to go. Later, Carey went to India where he proved to be a genius of languages. It was he who translated the New Testament into Bengali. Eventually, he was to give to the people of India the New Testament in 34 languages. A shoe cobbler. This cobbler, Carey, became a professor of Oriental languages, Oriental languages at the University of Calcutta. He wrote grammars and dictionaries and many Indian dialects. He was also a botanist and introduced to India many new, agri new agricultural and gardening methods. He was a creator of schools, a teeter, teacher of native evangelists. <laughs> because of his influence, listen now, here's just this shoe cobbler that felt the need to do what God told us to do to carry. See, Jesus said what? I'll build my what? Yeah. In America alone? No. He said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Here, Kerry goes to India, where that is one of the gates of hell, folks. He said, because of his influence, the savage habit of throwing children to crocodiles at religious festivals in Gango Sangor ceased, as did, the burning, as did the burning of widows and their being buried alive with their dead husbands. Because of the gospel, he also took care of lepers. When he was on his deathbed, one of those standing in the room praised Kerry. His last words were, you have spoken about Dr. Carey. When I'm gone, don't speak about Carey, but about Carey's Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, Jesus said. He himself, Carey, chose the epitaph for his grave. You know what his epitaph said? A miserable worm who appeals to your compassion. <laughs> Here was this man that reached millions, yet he was so humble in his death. John Williams, at the age of 20, went to preach to the islands of the Pacific. Traveling in a small ship, he went to Ratatonga, the, Samo the Samoan Islands, and Malaysia. Everywhere he went, he brought people to Christ and established churches. Idolatry and polygamy disappeared, and many islands became sanctuaries full of the praises of God. When a within a circumference of 2,000 miles, not, not one island remained without a church. <laughs> because one man decided to take the gospel to the Pacific Islands. In 1839, on the island of, of Iramanga, Williams was killed by cannibals after having brought 30,000 souls to Christ. John Patton came in Williams' place to these volcanic islands. At first, he was frightened by the bloodthirsty savages. Because of the influence of traitors, they hated the whites who brought new sicknesses to their people. In their culture, a man was free to kill his wife if he no longer favored her, and the killing of children was common among them. They also believed in witchcraft. But the gospel message, with the gospel message, Patton conquered the New Hebrides for Christ. John Eliot, the first missionary to the American Indians in the 17th century, was also the first to translate the Bible into a Native American language. Thus, the first Bible printed in the United States was for Native American Indians. 
Didn't know that, did you? To do so, he also gave them a written language and a grammar. At the age of 80, he still went to visit them in the forest. David Brainerd, his successor, went to live with the Indians in their savagery, sleeping on straw in a wood hut. The Dutch colonists mocked him, but he had only one wish, to win souls for Christ. And he did win souls, not only among the Indians. Henry Martin read his diary and said to himself, Now I will spend my life for God. Just by reading David Brainerd's diary, he became the pioneer missionary among the Muslims. In Germany, Count Zizendorf, when he was very young, stood before a picture of the crucified Jesus in the Dusseldorf Art Gallery. The picture bore the caption, This I have done for you. What are you doing for me? Zizendorf could not forget that question. He said, A faith that does, not, does nothing is just chatter. He formed the community of Moravians, which has as its slogan, The, the Savior deserves everything. <laughs> Missionaries from this community went to Greenland, to the Indians, and to the blacks. Zizendorf asked Sorensen, a person from this community, would you be willing to go to Labrador as a missionary? Sorensen answered, I would go tomorrow if I could get a pair of shoes. <laughs> Some of the missionaries were killed by the Eskimos, but others followed. Soon the Moravians had missionary activity in 28 countries. In 1740, a missionary by the name of Roch went to the Mohican Indians. Kai uh, Siup, one of his converts, later said, listen to this, it's, it had preachers come before. He, this Indian said, this Indian chief said, first we had a preacher coming to us, to told us who told us that there is a God. We finished with him. We had known that. Another told us, don't lie, don't steal, don't get drunk. We answered him, go and tell it to the white faces. <laughs> they do these things more than we do. But then Roch came. He spoke to us about the love of God, shown him the sacrifice of Jesus. And then he went to sleep quietly in my bed, not fearing that I might kill him. So I was one for Christ. Alan Gardner, 1794 to 1851, went as a missionary to Patagonia. Darwin had visited the area. You know who Darwin is? Darwin had visited the area and believed that the Patagonians were the link uniting man and ape. They had a very low forehead, and their thoughts and habits were debased. But within two decades, the missionaries changed everything. Darwin, after revisiting the country, said, I, have, I always believed that civilizing the Japanese was the greatest miracle of history. Now I'm convinced that what these missionaries have done in Patagonia by civil, civilizing the natives is at least as wonderful. And Darwin, he became one of their regular contributors to the Christian mission there. <laughs> Evolutionists today should follow his example. In recounting these adventures for God, we walk on holy ground. Let's take our shoes off, if you can. Hey, we're talking, we're, listen, we're on holy ground today because God's church is alive and well. The church is here meeting today, and, and the church is, a, is, is on the march all around the world. We remember Henry Thomas, one of the first missionaries to Korea. While he traveled upriver in a boat, stopping here and there to preach, the natives attacked him from the shore with spears. Wounded, he jumped into the water and in one last effort swam to the shore, holding up a parcel of gospels in his hand that he threw into the hands of the murderers. His, faint, his wound was fatal and he drowned. Some of his attackers were converted by reading these very gospels. We remember Bishop Hannington of Uganda who was eaten by the cannibals. While he was being taken to the place of execution, he loudly, loudly repeated over to himself, over and over, love your enemies, pray for those who wrong you, do good to those who do you evil. When the news of his death reached Britain, two of his sons decided to go as missionaries in his place and had the privilege of baptizing and later giving the Lord's Supper to those who had eaten their father. We think about Devas Gayan, a native of India. Because he preached the gospel, he was bound to an ox and led from one village to another where the inhabitants beat him. They put around his bare neck a garland of poisonous plants that pricked his skin. Then they put pepper in his open wounds. When one person expressed compassion for the chains he had to wear, he kissed the man and said, To me they are like beads of pearls. <laughs> Devis Gayan was a man who could not read, but when the passion of Christ was read to him, he said, Oh, Lord, how bad my life has been in comparison with yours. How can I live well when you suffer? His last words were, Lord Jesus, save me. 
During the war, Japanese burned alive, crucified, and disemboweled, disemboweled Christians, and they hanged them head down. They considered Christ to be the God of the Americans. For many blacks, Jesus is the God of the whites. For Jews, he's the God of the anti-Semites. For communists, he is the God of the capitalists. Missionaries are willing to face all these prejudices as they fulfill Christ's commandment, make disciples of all nations. What do you think? Did it, has a church, is the church gone under? It's still on the march. In every generation, God calls out new, new folks to serve him. God calls out young people. God calls out brand new people to go and replace those that have been martyred for his faith. Jesus said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now he's calling you. All these folks did their, did their time and, and did what God called them to do. And, and you saw the result on the maps, <laughs> the result of their efforts. Christianity is in every nation, in every tribe, and in every language on the earth. And, it, and it's growing rapidly around the earth. And, and the question for you today, are you on board? Are you on board? When I say if you're on board, I mean, are you saved? Have you been born again yet? Have you come to Christ for salvation? The challenge from the God of heaven to you today is come and drink of the water of life freely. You might, ought, you might ought to get on board today because some of you, this may be your last opportunity. I don't know how long that our nation will stand with the freedoms that we have. I know this, even if we lose the freedom to preach in the pulpits, the church won't die. <laughs> Glenn Beck said that half the churches will be gone in a, in a couple of years if the Supreme Court rules wrong on this certain issue they're working on right now with gay marriage. No, it won't. Now, some of the, the established churches, the doors might close. Church won't be dead because... The best church that ever happens is when it's forced underground. <clears throat> and like a strong, powerful stream, it goes underground. And when it bursts forth again, it's pure <laughs> and spotless and holy. Like the churches in the bam behind the bamboo curtain where there's 5% of the Chinese population <laughs> are Christians. You believe it? And all across the earth is the same story. God's church is on the march. It's alive and well. I hope you're a part of it. But you can't be a part of it unless you're saved. You have to come to Christ for salvation. And the way you do that is when you recognize your own sinfulness. You recognize that the only way that you'll ever get to heaven is if God lets you get in there because of what he's done for you. And I would like to offer an, an invitation today for those of you that don't know Christ yet, that you would come to him for salvation. But there might be some Christians here that, that aren't sold out. You're not 100% with it with the deal. <laughs> You're on board, but you're just kind of like hanging on. You're not really out on the, the cutting edge of the church. Listen, get on board, but let's go 100%. Let's go 110%. Be all out, all out for Jesus. Put it on the line for him. Stick your neck out. Bobby and Cena and a few others right now and Scott are sticking their neck out. It's like they're stepping out on the limb and they saw the limb off. They... they <laughs> We're on God's side. We're going to do it no matter what people think. You know what? Underneath are, underneath are the everlasting arms. They'll never fall. They'll never fail. If they follow Christ because Jesus said what? I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You do what God's telling you to do. Make the decisions he's telling you to make. If he's, He may be calling some of you to go other places than just America. Listen to what he's telling you and he will clearly tell you what you're supposed to do and be, be about the master's business. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the word and I thank you for Matthew 16, Lord, where you told us about your church. And Lord, you made the, the prophecy and the promise and the cemented it with your words, Lord, that your church would always be here and it would thrive. So Lord, help us to be about your business, to preach your gospel to every living creature to win our friends and neighbors to you, to win our nation back to you, Lord, and to take the message everywhere, Lord, while we still have time. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.